The presenting sponsor of Pod Save America is Simply Safe. It's Halloween season, so here's a little treat for you. Right now, you can save big with Simply Safe. Okay, they're giving Pod Save America listeners forty percent off their advanced security system. U.S. News named Simply Safe the best home security of 2022 because at Simply Safe, your safety is the only thing that matters. When a threat is detected, Simply Safe's monitoring professionals promptly contact you and dispatch first responders to your home, even if you're away or unable to respond. Their 24/7 professional monitoring costs under a dollar a day. Simply Safe blankets your home in protection with advanced sensors for every room, window, and door and even hazard sensors that instantly detect fires, floods, and other threats to your home. Their monitoring experts use proprietary advanced response technology to visually confirm when a break-in is real, so you can get the highest priority police dispatch. Like, love it. Love it. Does your Simply Safe protect you against monsters and... Oh, you bet. I've been... Um, ghosts. Gruffalos, maybe? I've started the show on Netflix called The Watcher, and uh, I uh, can't get through an episode at night because it is scary to watch when it is dark out. I can't but do that they don't either. have Simply Safe, and based on where it's going, I think they really could have used it. <laughs> uh, I have a Simply Safe. I set it up myself. It works really well. I highly recommend it. Don't miss this chance to save big when you protect your home with the best. Get 40% off your order when you visit simplysafe.com slash crooked today. Customize the perfect system for your home in just a few minutes. That's simplysafe.com slash crooked. There's no safe like Simply Safe. Welcome to Pod Save America. I'm John Favreau. I'm John Lovett. I'm Tommy Vitor. On today's show, Democrats deliver their closing argument. Trump and his goons get ready to screw with another election. And then we sat down with Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez on Sunday to talk about the midterms and more. And midnights. And we talked about midnights as well. Oh, yeah. You did ask some uh, Taylor Swift questions. Yeah, we went to UC Irvine for a get out the boat rally. Go Tom, Anteaters. Tommy was part of the program. He spoke. He, he Tommy spoke. revved up the crowd before yeah, AOC. I don't think we're putting it in this pod. But there was a moment where there was a bunch of MAGA protesters, and I was like, oh, they're going to boo Tommy. I cannot wait. (laughs) (laughs) It's going to be great. I went after them in my remarks. You did. You did. You did. He engaged. I uh, I engaged them. He engaged. I I singled them out, and then I did a let's go Brandon at the end. Yeah. Worked out well. All right. But first, before we get to the news and and Tommy and AOC, uh, election day is November 8th, but the voting has already begun. And everyone who's out there trying to save democracy needs your help. They need you to volunteer at phone banks, remind your friends to vote, read up on all those ballot initiatives, send people texts that aren't as annoying as those automated ones that come from Mm, the campaign. Yeah. So we need your help. So sign up to do all of this at votesaveamerica.com. We'll have plenty for you to do. You got to do it. You just have to do it. A couple weeks. A couple weeks. We're 15 days out. All right. Let's get to the news. 15 days. Uh, The worrisome polling trend that shows a lot of tightening midterm races hasn't changed all that much from last week, but the Democrats' strategy apparently has. The 538 average has Republicans up about a half a point on the generic ballot after a slew of polls that show inflation and economic concerns are once again voters' top priorities. Polls are uh, really putting the wine in wine, Mom. Oh, Oh, why, like, complaining? No, no, like, drinking. Like they're getting drunk. Oh, the oh, 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 I don't know if that was, you know, could have been a little sharp. Um, do you think the generic ballots ever like, I'm special too? Okay. Jesus, Jesus Christ. <laughs> if you, Stay if, with anyway, us. if you're still listening, <laughs> if you're still listening, uh, in response, every Democrat from Nancy Pelosi to Bernie Sanders to Joe Biden has been delivering a closing argument focused on Republicans, extreme economic policies. Uh, here's the president speaking at the White House on Friday. They're going to do big farmers bidding to repeal my plan to allow Medicare to negotiate prescription drugs prices. We pay the highest in the world. And in doing so, it's going to raise drug prices. And they're going to raise big farmers' profits. They're doing fine, big farmers. They're not hurting at all. And they're going to raise your health insurance premiums. It's mega, mega trickle down. Mega, mega trickle down. The kind of policies that have failed the country before and it'll fail it again. And it'll mean more wealth to the very wealthy, higher inflation for the middle class. That's the choice we're facing. That's why I think that we're going to do just fine. Mega MAGA trickle down rolls off the tongue. What do you guys think? 
I think the broader argument is good and necessary. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I was curious about why they did the event sort of focused on the deficit versus other issues, but I'm sure there's some polling somewhere that's driving the decision. I think they're speaking to the reality that huge chunks of the electorate is worried about the economy, inflation, and gas prices. We see it in polling, we see it in focus groups, hear about it on the wilderness. Mm. We see it in anecdotal mm -hmm. evidence uh, from events and it has stories. been showing up in the wilderness. <laughs> <laughs> you have Quite to. a few times. Biden, all Democrats need to speak to that. The anger, the anxiety, and make the argument that Democrats will fight for you, Republicans will make things worse. Some of that's gonna be policy-based, like we're gonna re-up the child tax credit, we're gonna reduce the price of drugs like Biden was talking about there. But the more important piece is that contrast about how Republicans, they're gonna fight for their donors, big pharma, fossil fuel interests, they're gonna make it worse. Um, I'll trust them on the, the, the mega, mega trickle down. Like I totally don't, <laughs> uh, look. Does it MMTD, it, that's what we're calling it. <laughs> again, they probably have data that I don't have. It, it, but my challenge with it is just sort of on its own. I don't know that everyone knows what it means because trickle down economics is kind of like a buzzword from the Reagan era. I'm not sure what mega maga means more than maga, but whatever. Ho hopefully it's catchy. We're talking about it. We're talking about it. It's ultra erasure. What happened to ultra? Yeah, what happened to ultra maga? Ultra maga. They they Rachel Maddow stole, Maddow stole it. Mega you, th you think she trademarked I'll ultra and then she, they sent yeah. a cease and desist to it the White House? It. I also thought when I first heard that Rachel Maddow was doing a podcast called Ultra, I was like, oh, this is going to be about MK Ultra, but it's not. Hmm. So I like, a lot here, of bad I'm going to say there. this. I'm going to say this. I like mega maga. Okay. You know? I like it better than ultra maga, which did sound fun, you know? Right. I just like MAGA. I think that's it. That's all you it's need. It's bad enough. It's bad enough. I do enough. think trickle down is in the category of like voodoo economics, mm -hmm. but you know what? It was catchy. It gets the message out. You know, there was a, the thing that was more interesting to me than mega, 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 <laughs> mega, mega. Maybe the strategy was to just mega, get everyone. I wrote <laughs> glitching, guys. Glitching. This uh, happens every election. He but uh, what I was more interested in is the, you know, like, what I was realizing in seeing this speech, and also obviously reading where I get all my opinions, message box by Dan Fiverr, mm -hmm. is Democrats did get behind this very clean idea, give us two more senators, keep the House, and we'll codify Roe. There was not as clean of an economic story, do this, do that, and we'll do these things, and getting back to the child tax credit, and some of this, making it more of a choice on the economy, because for the last couple of weeks, everybody's been talking past each other. You've had Republicans running nonstop crime, economy, ab immigration ads, and then you've had Democrats running Republicans or extreme abortion ads. And I'm not saying a lot of Democrats aren't talking about costs and inflation on the trail. They are, and maybe, and their ads are about it too. But for the most part, there wasn't that clean choice on the economy. It's a really good point. And wow, make, <laughs> look at I you. I have said that in fucking weeks. <laughs> like I, I would say years. <laughs> but, no. <laughs> here we go. But, well, you, you don't know when John sends you a yeah. well, comma, uh, yeah. that's when you know well, you're I was didn't say it's actually a good talking, point. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's, it, it's making me wonder why they didn't uh, propose any kind of economic agenda, the Democrats. I'm guessing it's probably because, so they passed the Inflation Reduction Act. And uh, then everyone, and so then they celebrate that. Look, we fixed everything. Then um, everyone freaked out about inflation. So I'm guessing they probably thought if we start proposing more spending, we'll just total it up. Then everyone will total it up. But I don't know if that's a reason to like not have an economic agenda <laughs> In, <laughs> for the for the midterms and beyond. You uh, know? Yeah, I would say I would do two points. One, I would say that uh, democracy is like a sexy baby, and inflation <laughs> is a monster on the hill. <laughs> That's point number one. Wait, wait, wait. You have to spell that out. I don't think I do. <laughs> okay. Oh, I think everyone knows that at this point. And then, but the second, and <laughs> I so, so the second one, I, in 2006, uh, when Democrats were running to win the House, uh, the, uh, the the Senate women, Democratic women, had a had a a little had a caucus, and they came out with their checklist for change, and it was a list of very clean, simple mm -hmm. policies. And so I remember the we can do better. I knew, I knew. So yeah, the checklist for change we were, we were was, stuck in we can do better was more yeah. of a kind of like acoustic set that didn't <laughs> <laughs> that they weren't really doing on the road. It was a smaller thing. It was more for touring, but the um didn't sell as well. But uh, uh, Hillary Clinton was going to speak at some kind of a, a of a rally or something and i wrote a whole speech and she threw it out and she just read the checklist for change and then when i got back to my desk i was like what the fuck just happened and then i had missed an email from hillary clinton saying i'd like my speech to focus on the checklist oh for God. change did you seriously <laughs> I swear to god oh my god 
It just reminded That's me of that nightmare. one that like, you know, 2006 was a lot about the failures of the Bush administration, but there was a clean, simple set yeah, of things Democrats were getting behind. That while was the you, corruption here. While you were telling that uh, very succinct story about the checklist for change, <laughs> I started thinking. <laughs> Unbelievable. What was that? Couldn't have been more than 90 fucking seconds. Yeah. I, I know you bring your, your fucking phone to the urinal, but some people have an attention span. It wasn't that bad. Well, no, no but the good news is um, hard, I thought hard. of an idea. Instead of <laughs> instead of like uh, you didn't have to propose a whole bunch of spending, you could have done the child tax credit, which yeah. they didn't get done, and you could have said, "Oh, and we're going to have it fully paid for by uh, taxing rich assholes, minimum sure. wage increase, something like that, right?" Or you know, the, all the loopholes that Kirsten Cinema made you take out of the uh, inflation like, reduction. We Put about them back in. That's your agenda. Like in, you know, you know, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, like. Uh, uh, online kind of conservatives been giving Gavin Newsom shit for talking about these uh, 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 gas credits in California. But like you were talking about this, that like people, like that's simple. That's something people can latch onto. That will help me. A bunch of 20 somethings who didn't even know a midterm election was coming were all talking to me about uh, when I asked them what Democrats they like, they talked about Gavin Newsom giving them gas cards. I didn't even know that was a thing. Turns out free money is popular. So uh, you guys both like this overall strategy of closing by focusing on the economy. Is there anything you change or add to the message? Anything else you guys? I mean, I imagine that most Democrats are going to do some sort of combination, right? It's it's not binary. Like, they'll have some negative spots focusing on their opponent's record on abortion, some general sort of oppo hits, some attacks on the economic record. But I do think, like, uh, ABC Ipsos, the, that poll found that Americans trust Republicans more than Democrats to handle like almost every economic problem, inflation, gas prices, the economy broadly. So I do think you have to go at that strength uh, to win those people back. What do you think about this uh, debt ceiling issue? Like I realize that the uh, Republican threat to hold the debt ceiling hostage for entitlement cuts is complicated. It seems like it's a tomorrow problem because it's gonna happen in like 2023. It's, it's like, as we know, all too well. It's extremely difficult to explain the intricacies of the debt ceiling to anyone. But I do think like, if you're just being honest about what might happen if Republicans take the House, there's going to be a lot of investigations. There's probably going to be impeachment of Joe Biden. There's going to be a lot of nothing that happens. Uh, They're not going to be able to pass anything because Joe Biden's still president and can veto anything, right? But they will actually be able to hold the fucking economy hostage with the debt ceiling unless they get their cuts to Social Security and Medicare. It's actually something that could very easily happen next year if Republicans take the House. And I just wonder if that's something that you really hit in your closing message. What do you guys think? It's tough. You know, I it's it's oddly in, in some ways it's similar to like our struggle to make this argument around Republicans as a threat to democracy, mm-hmm. you know, threats to democracy, the debt ceiling on some level require imagination. <laughs> in a way that inflation doesn't. You see it, you feel it. And I feel like right now, Democrats, we're paying in two different ways. Like on the one hand, we're paying because people really don't believe, there's a lot of cynicism. People don't really think things can get better. Hmm. But even after Trump and even after the pandemic, even after our financial crisis, there's still not so much pessimism that things act. people actually believe things can get much, 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 much worse. Right. They just it's hard to really explain to people. I don't think we've successfully I think we've done a really I think the hearings have done a really good job of making the case that January 6 is connected to a broader effort by Trump. But it's still seen as quite acute as opposed to the broader threat to democracy. And I think the same thing like on on economic issues, we haven't done a good enough job of explaining to people what Republican extremism actually will result in. And so two weeks before the election, making this argument around a debt ceiling, a concept they never fully grasped the last time we went through this fight and how bad it could be, even though we had that argument and we said how bad it could be and then it didn't happen yeah. a couple times in the past. I just think I'm not saying it's a bad idea. I think it's hard. Though the politics were pretty bad for Republicans last time they tried to do it. Of the yes. shutdown, yeah, yes, and that's the, a very different the dead ceiling thing. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Know. That was that was a great. I remember that moment. Even it was bad for us too, but it was bad for the. They ended up blinking. Yes, they did blink. They did blink, of course. But I'm just saying, you have to find a way to tell that story. That's sort of they will hold the economy hostage to cut social security and, and r- cut taxes for for rich people is more about the policies, not the hostage taking. Yeah, it may be easier to hit them for what people have preconceived notions on or the Republican Party, which is. You know, even if you're not a partisan, what do you think about the Republican Party? Uh, they help the rich and they're pretty extreme on social policies like yeah. uh, their abortion bans. Right. And so you think they want to I, I still think it goes back to 
oh, you want to solve inflation? They're not going to solve inflation. They're going to help their rich friends and ban abortion everywhere. That's, that's Yeah, they'd rather they'll threaten the whole economy to cut taxes for rich yeah. people. So, Tommy, uh, Stan Greenberg, who's a longtime Democratic pollster, who has always argued for more populism, uh, recently told Politico that the worst performing message he's tested is Democrats touting their accomplishments. Uh, what did you make of that interview with Politico? Yeah, tough message from uh, from Stan. I mean, I do intuitively it made sense to me. A huge percentage of the country thinks the country is on the wrong track. I think I saw 71% in some polls over the weekend think yeah. we're on the wrong track. If our message comes through to those voters sounding like, look what I did for you, as opposed to a more nuanced, look, we got a lot of work to do. Here's our track record so far, but this is what we'll keep fighting for. And this is who's in the way. I could understand how that would land wrong and maybe annoying. So I do think it's maybe a little nuanced, although, um, you know, Stan's full quote was was stark. Yeah, I mean, the, the you like, a good example of something that sounds like a big note, but it's actually a small note, <laughs> which is that like in framing, the, and Biden actually does that quite well. And a lot, sometimes he goes a little ham on just look what we did, look what we did. But a lot of that speech is about framing it as a forward looking choice. Like here's what we're doing and here's how it will help you. Here's how we'll keep doing that. Here's why Republicans would try to undo it, right? I think it's really about, it's like the idea of taking what we've done and making it a story about how things will, can get better if you stick with us and how they'll make everything worse is obviously I think right. Yeah, I think the accomplishments basically only serve as credibility for when you say, I'm going to take on the drug companies, the insurance mm -hmm. companies, the oil companies, because look, I've already been taking them on over the last couple of years, right? Like that, they can serve as that. Beyond that, I think. Well, also, a lot of can. things we did take a, are, are going to take years to go into effect. You right. know, like the climate spending is not helping anybody out right now. The the Medicare negotiation of drug prices doesn't happen for years. Right. I mean, like, what are we telling people we did for them? I, we, we, we hooked you up in 2026. That doesn't work. And I don't think that people are sitting around being like, oh, well, I, I thought that the price of gas is expensive right now and that costs are pretty high. But then you just told me the gas prices have gone down for a couple of days in a row. So I, I'm sorry. I stand corrected. I think there's like a mood music. I get why the White House is always pushing, like Ron Klain specifically retweeting like the gas price buddy guy and trying to like sort of push the narrative that prices are going down. I think that's more of like a media narrative yes. thing because they are so quick right. to freak out when the Saudis and OPEC announce a production cut, never mind the fact that it's not clear that it'll make any actual material impact on the amount of gas uh, or oil on the market right now. But like prices go up, the media freaks out and they overreact. So he's trying to push back and overcorrect to that. And that impacts sort of the mood music around an election. And I get it. Yeah. There's a difference between uh, working the refs on Twitter and like what you put in your campaign ad. Sure. Or, or saying a speech, I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, we, we, we've also, like, we've, we've seen this movie before uh, Obamacare took a number of years to become popular and to become cemented in people's um, kind of Brains. brains is something good that they wanted to keep to the point where Republicans, even when they had the votes, couldn't repeal it. Just we had to lose um, a thousand uh, seats to get there. Yeah. Uh, anything else you guys have seen in the polling or early vote numbers that stick out at you? In the ABC poll that we were just talking about that has a bunch of really bad news, it says if a candidate in this November's election says they believe the 2020 presidential election was stolen from Donald Trump, are you more likely to vote for that candidate? 52% uh, said no. So there Oof. is still this desire to vote against these fucking people. It's out there. It's there. We just, it's like, it just, it has to, it has to stay in people's minds. It has to be connected to these other issues that feel more tangible. And I just, that's the, I, I, that's the struggle. I, I think you have to believe that if you vote for these Republicans, then like it's going to negatively impact your life yeah. in a whole bunch of ways. And you have to see what those impacts are and know what they are, right? Like, I think it is, I think, for example, you know, Josh Shapiro is very far ahead of Doug Mastriano in Pennsylvania. I think the, uh, knock on wood. Knock on some mm -hmm. goddamn wood. But now he's, you know, it's a it's a greater margin in that race in most of these polls than the Federer and Oz race. And I think Shapiro did a very good, has done a very good job saying like, we're talking about abortion. It's very simple in this case. Josh Shapiro's governor, abortion is uh, legal in Pennsylvania. Uh, Mastriano's governor, it's not. Yeah. And people get that, yeah. you know? And so I just think like drawing these connections about what, these aren't just like Republican extremists who are scary. If they are elected, this is what will happen that will impact you. Yeah, there was, um, you know, we, we've been having this conversation. We asked OC, a, AOC about it. We asked President Obama about it, which is, you know, we be, we believe correctly that democracy is under threat. We yet that doesn't seem to be driving a lot of people in their final decision. Like a lot, enough people are so worried about some of these other economic concerns. And there was a poll that reminded me of from earlier in the year, which said that 64% of Americans uh, 
agree that American democracy is in crisis, but more 70% feel America itself is in crisis. And I feel like in that you feel this, you feel the connection between these economic issues and these concerns about day to day, the day to experience of just trying to get by and the crisis we're trying to draw people's attention to in democracy, which is one way in which people really feel democracy is failing is it's just not delivering. And like, that's the kind of cynicism that we're kind of entering into this fight. And it's, it's tough. You know who is delivering? Who? Hashtag Democrats. Hashtag, hashtag Democrats, Democrats deliver. Oh, we do it's deliver. been a while since the Democrats <laughs> did that hashtag. Tell me anything we you saw. We can do better. Anything you saw in the polling or the early vote numbers? No, and I'm also just going to not let myself read about, think about, worry about early vote numbers because we're coming off a pandemic. We're still somewhat in one. I don't know. All the rules are changing in different states. Like it's just you can you can look at the early vote numbers and the and the um the 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 early vote numbers and the mail in ballot numbers we've seen, and you can blur your eyes and say it looks good. You can blur your yeah. eyes and say it yep. looks bad. It, nobody fucking knows. Totally. Yeah, I would say that by the end of uh, next week, uh, we it, look at John Ralston's blog in Nevada. Mm -hmm. And he updates with all the early vote numbers. It's too early now, he's, as he says when he updates it. But like by, by two weeks in, you get a good sense. Yeah, if you want to feel bad for a full <laughs> two weeks about the results rather than just on election day, check out Ralston's blog. Yeah, and if you just want to like cut yourself every yeah, exactly, it's sort exactly. of that's, that's, that's a nice thing. Do it. Pots of America is brought to you by Bombas. Bombas's mission is simple: make the most comfortable socks ever and match every item sold with an equal item donated. So when you buy Bombas, you're also giving to someone in need. Bombas designed their socks to be the socks you can't wait to put on every day. Everything they make is soft, seamless, tagless, and has a cozy feel. Bombas socks come in tons of options like comfy performance styles made with sweat-wicking yarns and no-show socks specially engineered to never fall down. I love a no-show sock. And it's really annoying when they fall down. It is. So the good for Bombas for figuring that out. Good for Bombas. Good for Bombas. Did I you really know? like Bombas. I miss them as a sponsor. Me too. I'm glad they're back. Did you know that socks are one of the most requested clothing items at homeless shelters? I did. That's why Bombas donates one for every item you buy. So far, Bombas customers like you have helped donate over 50 million items of essential clothing. They're super comfortable socks. They're very colorful. They get a lot of different styles. They're fun. They're comfy. My whole family has them. Yeah, they're really good. Uh, go to bombas.com slash crooked and use crooked for 20% off your first purchase. That's B-O-M-B-A-S dot com slash crooked and use code crooked at checkout. Bombas.com slash crooked, code crooked. Pod Save America is brought to you by Aspiration. When it comes to saving the planet, there's no neutrality. If you keep your money in most standard bank accounts, they're lending your deposits out to fund oil and coal. Switch to the planet side and get Aspiration. Aspiration is a climate-friendly alternative to big banks. Get an account and debit card that's built to help your wallet and the planet. Moving $1,000 to an Aspiration Plus account has the same impact as driving 6,000 miles less. Plus, you can earn up to 71 times as much interest than you do at your old bank. Aspiration is fossil fuel free and lets you plant a tree by rounding up every swipe of your debit card. Aspiration's been hard at work helping people align their money with their values, funding the planting of over 100 million trees on their way to funding the planting of 1 billion by 2030. It's no wonder why Forbes, NerdWallet, and The Penny Hoarder recommend Aspiration for the eco-conscious. Best of all, there's no credit check, no overdraft fees, and with Aspiration, you just pay what you think is fair, even if that's zero, because money shouldn't stand in the way of you doing the right thing. Make your dollars make a difference. Open an Aspiration account at aspiration.com slash crooked debit and move your money out of fossil fuels. Help save the planet with your Aspiration debit card. Open your account at aspiration.com slash crooked debit today. Aspiration.com slash crooked debit. Terms and conditions apply. Pods of America is brought to you by Karayuma, the sustainable sneaker worn by skaters, surfers, and us. They're reimagining classic sneakers with you and the planet in mind. Cozy season is in full swing. We always call it cozy season here. And they're making the cool, seriously comfortable shoes you need right now. This bestseller comes in organic cotton canvas or ultra soft, responsibly sourced suede. Low tops are a given. But the Aka family includes a padded high top silhouette for a cozier fit. Karyuma also gives us a little insight into their top selling colors this season. Check out their rose, their gray, their off white canvas styles, or treat yourself to a pair of navy or camel suede. Made from real camels. That's true. Made from real camels. That's a joke. It's not true. The classic look means you only need one pair, but try them on and you might wonder if one is enough. 
How many pairs of sneakers do you own? John, are you technically a hoarder, given how many Karayumas you own and wear? I No, I try to get rid of the, the oldest ones because it's there's, I, I can't be having that many sneakers in my house. Well, I actually have only Karayumas. Who sneakers. can blame you for wanting more? No one. No one should blame me. The biggest difference between these sneakers and others, uh, beyond premium materials and handcrafted quality, Akka is seriously comfortable. We all know comfort comes first, whether you're running to catch the train or an early morning swell, which is always what Lovett's doing. For every pair of sneakers sold, Karayuma's team plants two trees in the Brazilian rainforest. Two trees! Karayuma ships fast and free in the USA, in addition to worldwide shipping and 60-day extended returns free of charge. They deliver right to your front door using single box recycled packaging. Now, for a limited time, Pod Save America listeners can get an exclusive 15% off your pair of Karayuma sneakers. Go to cariuma.com slash crooked to get 15% off. That's cariuma.com slash crooked for 15% off only for a limited time. Anyway, speaking of the uh, not enough people identifying threat to democracy as their top issue, as Lovett was just saying, over the last few days, we got a few more reminders about why this isn't great. In Pennsylvania, uh, Rolling Stone and Semaphore report that Trump is already laying the groundwork to challenge the midterm results in that state. And he's also trying to get their Republican legislature to ban mail-in ballots. Uh, in Arizona, multiple reports of voter intimidation have been sent to the Department of Justice after armed vigilantes started patrolling drop boxes. Very cool. And in Nevada, the Washington Post reports that election officials and supervisors in most counties have left their jobs over threats and abuse, while the guy who's leading the race to become Secretary of State, Jim Marchant, just ran this ad. George Soros is helping to elect anti-American politicians, and these same politicians keep winning re-election. How is that possible? It's not. Elections have consequences, and rigged elections have catastrophic consequences. Help save America. Vote for Jim Marchand for Secretary of State. It's time to take our elections back. Now, uh, you can't see it because this was audio, but the politicians in that ad that he was saying weren't elected or were elected you know, improperly, Pelosi, Schumer, Schiff, and Nadler. Oh, wow. Well, do we know that they were elected properly? <laughs> mm-hmm. That's who he's saying was, uh, was the beneficiary of rigged elections. He's going as far back as... Uh... <laughs> I mean, it's a great style of politics if you can get it. You know, I won or else uh, if you won, it was illegitimate. Heads I win, that's, tails you lose. Right. That's, that's what a that's fun thing. Is. Do you guys think that stories like these are just not getting through to voters? Or do you think they're getting through but that these voters just aren't prioritizing democratic threats over economic concerns. I mean, I think fundamentally that like the three of us, people who listen to this show are space aliens compared to most of the country and the amount they pay attention to politics. So they're probably just not paying attention. They're probably paying even less attention to down ballot races and what a secretary of state does, what a county clerk does. Um, You kind of have to explain what these jobs even do before you can really describe how Republicans are screwing it up. There's also probably a bit of a a boy who cried wolf thing, you know? I mean, we were laughing before we started recording that, and we're as guilty of this as everyone, when every election is the most important election of our lifetime, maybe you tune that out, they stop believing you, the hyperbole goes a little too far. But I do think like, like we criticize the media a lot, I do think they need to do better here because when votes came in late in Pennsylvania, and that led to people questioning the validity of the results. That was a deliberate Republican strategy. They mm-hmm. voted to ensure that those votes weren't counted until after polls closed on election day. So it looked suspicious. That's why Donald Trump gave us those fun quotes about the big late night dump. We all remember that fondly. Less fun now. He's going to try to get rid of um, mail-in voting I and do it that, again. I thought that then the media did a pretty good job like explaining to viewers that night what was going on there and like why what trump was trying to do and what republicans are trying to do i do think that it's going to happen again in these midterms and now is the time where a couple weeks out where the media should probably let people know yeah that the same thing is going to happen again that night sure but like look where we are today where you know you have like half the country questions the validity of these elections we you know look, we've spent time on the show talking about the media and where where we think it, it is uh not up to snuff i would say from time to time and we talk about the way in which they kind of are biased towards treating every fight like a political food fight between democrats and republicans i think sometimes we forget that that's a bias people have too for sure. and, and it's especially true amongst independents who are paying attention less and are more likely to just be cynical and dismissive about Democrats and Republicans. There was a poll out of Arizona 
41 percent said they want election officials who say Joe Biden won. 18 percent said they want officials who said Biden didn't win. And the remaining 41 percent don't care either way. And that's even bigger for independents. And it really tells you that, like, I don't that's that's, of course, where how is this information mediated through terrible political coverage? But there really is like Republicans have successfully made. Did Joe Biden win the election? A partisan question. And people now view that as a partisan question that they they think that it is more nonpartisan. They're like, oh, I don't want somebody who thinks about that issue either way. And I just think we're paying for the ways in which this has become a right left divide. And I think to be fair to the non MAGA media, like which they, we we want to do, they've been pretty pretty clear who won the election, yeah. who was lying. They use the phrase big lie all the time. They talk about election deniers all the time. And the reason it's not getting through to people is I think originally what Tommy said, which is it's just most people aren't consuming that information. Most people aren't fucking New York Times readers. They're not Washington Post readers. Right. They're not watching the big three networks. It's just not happening. I, I, yeah. This, I mean, this did manifest. There's some reporter on reporter violence on, on Twitter last night about this topic, about whose oh, job no. it is to talk about. I mean, I, there is a piece of this. Well, uh, remember, democracy dies in darkness. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it, it, it didn't. Did it? The Washington Post slogan: "It wasn't democracy dies in darkness if Democrats say it does." And uh, <laughs> in, in response, a Republican spokesman said, uh, "No, uh, socialism killed the democracy." And then a political science professor said, uh, "Both sides have flaws," which you know, would have been a very yeah, long tagline. You know, that's not how I think. You know, it's very frustrating for me. Yeah, yeah. No, they they, they put a stake in. They 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 said we're going to do democracy like the, dies in darkness. The Washington Post is on great reporting. I'm not criticizing anyone. The piece we're talking about for this segment is actually by Dana Milbank, an opinion columnist at the Washington Post. But I think there's this this argument happening about whether Democrats should be the one educating voters about these threats to democracy. And my view on that is no, our job is to win elections, period. I do not think it's our job oh, I think it's our to job. be the one carrying the message and educating people about every single issue. We can talk about it, but if it's at the expense of talking about something that's more likely to make us win, Fuck that. It's every talk I think about what yeah, makes but, us. Yeah, but look, we have the we, we go you go to war with the media you have, not the media you wish you had. Like they're the media. They're they're gonna run stories about it or not run stories about it. If they're not educating people about the threats of democracy, then really we have no other choice. I mean, but I, if the I know threats are not what are motivating people to turn out and vote, like the poll love it just read, oh. they're then I think are then we should fight on economic grounds or on abortion oh, or whatever I agree with it takes that. to I agree win. With that. I'm just saying that, that I don't think the, I don't think we should be counting on that. Like, look, no, like, of course not. I'm not counting on them. I'm, I think I'm I, a shadow boxing just a Twitter connect. in my own head. Is yeah, I think that, and I like I said, I love fucking complaining about the media. We I think they're it. doing a great job on this. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's not let's not lose our heads. I would say I would say two things. One, yes, it is Democrats' job to win elections. The most important thing Democrats can do to defend democracy is not convince people democracy is under threat. The most important thing we can do is win. Uh, that said. Uh, it is, I think, absurd for reporters who are not supposed to care who wins or who loses to say, oh, uh, if if uh, the American people don't understand the threat to democracy, which when we're talking at a bar, when I'm not writing this in the newspaper, I share completely in your concern about uh, if that fails to resonate and that means that there's a bunch of election deniers who win and then we have a bunch of elections thrown into chaos, too bad the Democrats didn't have a better strategy. That's it's not my job to do their job concern. for them. It's everybody's job. Yes. It's everybody's job. And like everybody kind of wrings their hands of this. Um, but it all comes down, <laughs> but it does come down to convincing voters of this. And if the voters are not paying attention to the media, which most of them are not paying attention to political news, then whose job? Because you get a lot of people who are like, oh, people are just pissed about high gas prices at a moment when democracy is under threat. And it's like, yeah, I wish that wasn't the fucking case either, yeah, no. but they are. Yeah. And the only way that you have a democracy is to actually convince people who are pissed about high gas prices to vote for your person. That's, <laughs> and to convince and them that's that, how you save democracy. And to convince them, I mean, look, like, Democracy you know, and also it's like democracy is about like people like self governance. The, these people are feeling like they're not being governed well. <laughs> so like, listen to them. We have grown understandable. pretty complacent. I mean, this is actually uh, when we were when we were talking to uh, Obama like last week. Like I went, what, you watch a speech in Stockholm, and one of the points he made is that Western democracies have grown pretty complacent. And one of the ways we've grown complacent is we take for granted that oh, obviously democracy is the best way to solve problems. But when you have polls after poll that show people they don't believe in the system, they don't believe things will get better, they don't believe Democrats help, they don't believe Republicans help. Every if you're listening to this, you know how much we know there are structural disadvantages. We know how the filibuster has stood in our way and gerrymandering and and the, and the electoral college and the, the courts and all of that. All of that is true, of course. And yet 
we are still inside of that system trying to convince people that it works. And when they care about these other issues and they don't see a democracy delivering, of course, they're not believing this is, this, is, this is the big threat we face. This is why it's just an asymmetric fight, because Democrats fundamentally believe that government should exist and help people and Republicans want to drown it in a bathtub. And that's why yeah. uh, Republicans can prevent any immigration reform from happening. And then Ron DeSantis can do this stunt and fly people to Martha's Vineyard and it's a news cycle for a week and it hurts us because of a problem his party is perpetuating. Yeah, and and that's why and everyone's like, oh, Republicans are so smart. Why are they so smart and we're not? Why do they play dirty and we're not? It's like, no, 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 they just have an easier job. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> they're, they're, try, they're just trying to tell you that government doesn't work. And, and people don't have faith in institutions. Kind of, right, exactly. And, and that's and it's also like, it's not just a political problem. I mean, people like conspiracy theories. They like feeling like there is some grand plan that only they understand and know about. Like, I kind of feel like you're pushing on a, a, an open door by telling people that, oh yeah, of course elections are rigged and stolen. Like people kind of want to believe that stuff. And people are more likely to believe conspiracy theories at a time when they don't have faith in institutions, right? Like those things go together as well. And when they're drowning in a bunch of fucking noise on their social media feeds and then the local news has been co-opted co by Sinclair and oh, there's Fox News and oh, you know, liberal billionaires want centrism and conservative billionaires want to burn the fucking country to the ground. Like they're headwinds, people. Yeah, and look, <laughs> <laughs> this is this is not to be all like nihilistic about shit. Absolutely not. It's just to say that like when there's a whole country of people out there who don't necessarily agree with you, do not assume it's because they've been like brainwashed by right wing media and Donald Trump or assume that it's just because they don't give a shit about your issues. Like people are complicated. Their lives are complicated. They're not consuming the same media you are. Yeah, I, I, like, I think the bigger mistake the pundit class sometimes makes is to like scold people based on their own hierarchy of needs. <laughs> it's like, I don't know, maybe if you couldn't literally couldn't afford to put gas in your car, you would care about that more than democracy. I get that one is bigger and existential and a longer term risk to all of us. But you know, sometimes yeah. when you're dealing with something right now that's what you care about yeah it's like w wish everyone thought the way we did yeah. of course yeah given they don't so what do we do now it's uh yeah <laughs> and it also you know it's like uh we also pay in part because it's like the the conservative elite is driving is like funding and driving this massive propaganda apparatus and the vast majority of uh of news anchors of like of talk show hosts of all of them like they are they are not connect they're in a couple cities and they are not connected to the material needs of the vast majority of people and it's why like you turn on like what's supposed to be the lib like the liberal version of fucking Sean Hannity someone like Bill Maher it's like half the episodes about democrats being terrible and the other half's about cancel culture it's like there's very few places to go where this where like the actual substance of what like the 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 actual lived experience people are having with the state of the economy meets a actual rational conversation about what would help and what wouldn't it just simply doesn't exist in our political media system at all and meanwhile carrie lake is a, a local anchor for 20 years yeah center yeah. fucking that seems like a flaw shooting, in the whole thing shoot, sh shooting her videos through two inches of fascist gauze <laughs> that was my that was my nice thing that i said about her what was it what was it <laughs> good camera angles we had to in the in the last episode of psa when hallie had us uh, play that game where Dan and I each had to say something nice about the candidate. Mm -hmm. My thing with Carrie Lake was her uh, sepia toned. <laughs> Looks fantastic. <laughs> Instagram yeah, it does filter. work. Anyway, this is all why. <laughs> <laughs> all of this is to say that um, these elections are close. All these races are very close. They're all fucking margin of error races. And the conversations you have between now and election day really will matter. I, I will say, uh, sitting in a studio and talking about the state of democracy can feel dark. Yesterday, getting out to Irvine, being with hundreds and hundreds of young voters who were fired up, talking with AOC, like getting on the trail, that feels really good. Yeah. So highly and then, recommend people And then do that. seeing all the, the assholes screaming, uh, fuck Joe Biden, that felt less good. Honestly, I found them kind of funny. It, 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 <laughs> it, 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 it made me have a sort of a pro wrestling vibe to the whole thing you do realize it's they bore, have a heel they do bore themselves out pretty quickly you know yeah. they're sort of it's like they start they start and then like halfway through the second speaker they're just like eh, we're just gonna chant the same thing now yeah, it's not it's, much it's, else to it's say. although there was no. one there was one um there was one woman who was walking around with a flag that said like american christian something and with like and just shouting bloody murder mm. and then all of a sudden she like disappeared for 30 seconds she came back and she had a different flag which was all lives matter and it's like so you switched were switched flags switched mid, flags mid rally yeah. didn't switch flags mid rally <laughs>
Everyone knows that. Anyway, if you got a ballot sitting at home, uh, Vote Save America has you covered. Our ballot tool has been updated with all the information you need about what's on your ballot, when and where you can vote, and you can get reminders to do it. It's all in one convenient location now. Just head to votesaveamerica.com slash be a voter. B dash A dash voter. That's the that's B dash. What is wait, was that the website? Voter. Yeah. Just go to votes. Just go to votes. Vote 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 and that. hit enter after. Enough of these bespoke <laughs> URLs. Yeah, you're fine. You'll figure it out. Uh, Sign up. <laughs> when we come back, our interview with AOC. Now a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. When you're faced with challenges in life, it can be tough to train your brain to stay in problem-solving mode, but when you learn how to find your own solutions, there's no better feeling. You guys ever get stuck focusing on problems instead of solutions? Every goddamn day of my life. He ain't lying. Every, every, every single morning. How might that situation go better with a different mindset? Oh, man. You just got to talk it out. got to talk it out, and you can talk it out with a therapist. Therapists can help you become a better problem solver, making it easier to accomplish your goals no matter how big or small. You know what I always say? What? You can light a candle, you can curse the darkness. <laughs> a therapist is just a friend. A therapist taught me that. You don't have to pretend to care what they say back, you know? That's right. You know I mean? Yeah, I always start therapy yeah. with, how's it going? And, how are you? And, I don't care. And she says, you tell me. And it's like, oh, this is you're perfect. Like, That's what you're supposed to do. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, why can't I have this in more of my life? I, I, actually, I do, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> That's partly why you're going. <laughs> if you're thinking of giving therapy a try, BetterHelp is a great option. It's convenient, accessible, affordable, and entirely online. Everyone needs therapy. It's good to go. You should go. Everyone except Milo. <laughs> right. yeah, we, has Milo heard any of these He's ads? Good. <laughs> we'll find out. <laughs> Get matched with a therapist after filling out a brief survey and switch therapists at any time. When you want to be a better problem solver, therapy can get you there. Visit betterhelp.com slash PSA today to get 10% off your first month. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash PSA. Pod Save America is brought to you by Real Paper. And now it's time for a brief lesson on the history of toilet paper. Okay. Oh boy. Where are we going? The first perforated toilet paper rolls were introduced in 1890, but it wasn't until 1930 that we officially had splinter-free tissue. Come Oof, on. Yikes. I gotta tell you, being a person, being a person was simply untenable till I think like 97. <laughs> really? Prior to that, well, we listen to Wow, that. Prior, still body wash to Prior to that, people just used what was on hand. Corn cobs, parchment even pages God. from the farmer's almanac think why, about what people's the buds book? were like There's for like all of human history we don't think about it enough get a leaf not my the book. goodness now now nowadays we're clear cutting our forest just to make something that we use once and flush down the toilet real makes sustainable toilet paper that contains no trees and instead uses 100 percent bamboo reels paper is certified by the forest stewardship council meaning that they are responsibly harvesting the bamboo grass that's used for their paper you got to get the Forest Stewardship Council seal of approval. Yep. Uh, and while the other conventional tree-based papers are wrapped in plastic in the grocery aisle, Real Paper's packaging is plastic-free, compostable, and offers free shipping on all orders. Please add your own personalization endorsement. What do you like about Real Paper? I like that it feels good on my bum. It doesn't give you splinters based on this history lesson. That's why I like That's it. great. I also like that it comes, uh, it's delivered. So that I'm not like uh, buying toilet paper at the store because yeah. that is just taking up too much of the cart. Because that's a pain in the ass, John. Tommy's got it. Tommy's got it. Nice. Real paper is available in easy, hassle free subscriptions or for one time purchases on their website. All orders are conveniently delivered to your door with free shipping and 100% recyclable plastic free packaging. No ifs, ands, and buds. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that Get over that splinter thing. If you, head to, if you head to realpaper.com slash cricket and sign up for a subscription using our code cricket at checkout, you'll automatically get 30% off your first order and free shipping. That's R E E L P A P E R.com slash cricket or enter promo code cricket to get 30% off your first order plus free shipping. So let's stop flushing our forests and try Real's tree free paper. Real is paper for the planets. Pod Save America is brought to you by Article. Article's got everything you need to turn your bedroom into your best room, all for a great price. Article offers cozy beds, swanky headboards, and tons of lighting options to help you set the tone. We love Article here. We have Article furniture all over Crooked. Also, my in-laws got Article furniture for their new home up in Maine. And they are very happy about it and almost forgot to use our code Crooked. And then we had to rectify that situation. But now they have their furniture and they're super happy. It's very comfortable. It's affordable. It comes fast. It's great. Uh, Article is the easier way to make your space look beautiful. 
They combine the curation of a boutique furniture store with the comfort and simplicity of shopping online. Their team of designers focus on beautifully crafted pieces, quality materials, and durable construction. They're dedicated to a modern aesthetic of mid-century Scandinavian industrial and bohemian designs. Fast, affordable shipping is available across the USA and Canada. Free on orders over $999. All in-stock items are delivered in two weeks or less. They cut out the middleman and sell directly to you. No showroom, salespeople, or retail markups. And you save up to 30% over traditional retail prices. Articles offering our listeners $50 off your first purchase of $100 or more. To claim, visit article.com slash cricket and the discount will be automatically applied at checkout. That's A-R-T-I-C-L-E dot com slash cricket for $50 off your first purchase of $100 or more. We are so excited to welcome on to the pod, uh, Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez. It's great to meet you. Great to see you in person. Yeah, of course. Thank you. It's Uh, great to be here. We're sitting here at UC Irvine because we're all Katie Porter fans. Uh, We're about to go to a rally hosted by the Orange County Young Democrats. Um, Just want to talk about the midterms because our listeners are uh, freaking out, maybe. They, They probably refresh 538 too often, too many Nates in their lives, <laughs> not loving what they're seeing the last couple of weeks. How are you feeling about the elections? And like, what's your pitch to our audience, to everyone about why we need to turn out in midterms and volunteer and kind of how you're feeling about things? Yeah. I mean, I, I think polling data, it, it's, it's a data point, but it's really not the end all be all. And if anything, it should act as just a motivator. Right. The, the stakes of this midterm are so incredibly high. Um, if Republicans take the House, they have stated in no unclear terms that they intend to support a national criminal abortion ban, that they want to hold the United States economy hostage in order to gut Social Security and Medicare. And I mean, like the list goes on, climate change, criminalization of everything, yeah. all, all this stuff, not to mention just trying to put a halt to any of, of the progress that President Biden has been trying to make and um, and the, the progress that he has been making. But if anything, I think that the discontent is that we need to be doing so much more, not so much less. But the stakes are really high right now. It's very serious. I was on a flight um, on the way out here, and the flight attendant just kind of came up to me, and she just started getting tears in her eyes, and she just said, I'm just so scared. I'm just so scared. Are we going to be okay? And what I had to really tell her was, listen, I'm not going to tell you not to worry. I think we need to work really, really hard because we are still very much at this very critical precipice of fascism in this country. And that's very, very real. Yeah. So I, I noticed you you let off with the concern about abortion access in this country and then, you know, the gutting of Social Security and Medicare. So, you know, I noticed Bernie Sanders has been talking about sort of warning that, hey, Democrats, we need to make sure we get the right balance in talking about both of those issues, not just talking about abortion access. Oh, also yeah. I'm wondering, like, do you think there is an imbalance currently in the messaging? And, and if if you do think there is one, what's the right balance in talking about, like, obviously critical issues? Yeah, I think that we can speak more forcefully to the intersection of class and identity issues. Um, a lot of times there's this accusation that's made that issues, if you're talking about gender rights, if you're talking about race race issues, Um, and racial inequities, that this is somehow separate or distinct from focusing on what, quote unquote, really matters, Mm -hmm. issues like class and inflation. And I think it's really important that we send a message that is that, I mean, really, it's not a buzzword, a message that is very distinctly intersectional. Abortion is a class issue. If you are working hourly and you get pregnant and you are not prepared to have this child, you are are really concerned about generational poverty and you are really concerned about putting food on the table, not just for yourself or any children you may already have. And the other way around too, I think that we can beef up and be more aggressive in talking about root causes of inflation being corporate greed. This is not, you know, inflation is kind of spoken about as this 
really vague kind of floaty concept, but that we're all feeling, yeah, right? Yeah. Prices of things are going up, but we don't really talk about why. And we need to have a real confrontation about the consolidation of market power and the fact that increasingly the most basic goods that we have, housing, food, et cetera, are concentrating into oligopolies and that it is these huge corporations that are price gouging just because they can, mm -hmm. just because they want to. Um, and it's not just, oh, prices are going up because of supply chain issues. It's really a lot more distinct than that. You mentioned uh, sort of the dangers of fascism and authoritarianism. I think we all feel that. I know you feel that acutely. You were in the Capitol on January 6th. Obviously, we had these hearings that we all paid super close attention to. You know, you ask most voters what they care about and inflation tops the list, abortion access tops the list. And I think, you know, in the New York Times poll, it was like 7% of people said uh, democrats, threats of democracy in the way that we think about it, election denial, all that kind of other stuff. Uh, there was also like 40% of people would be willing to vote for an election denier. Mm -hmm. How do you balance the need to make sure people understand the threat that we're facing um, with also speaking to people's immediate concerns, which tend to be about issues that immediately impact their lives in a way that they can see. Yeah. I mean, I think we have two things here. We have long-term arguments and long-term issues and how we deal with issues long-term and a lot of these short-term arguments and issues. Um, when I think about threats to democracy, when we message that, that in and of itself can seem like a vague message. What we have to communicate in our senses. Good storytellers communicate in their five senses. What does it look like? What does it sound like? What does it smell like, taste like, if that, um, if, if that applies? And so when we say threats to democracy, that doesn't give a visceral sensory understanding of what that means. Um, but if you are, you know, if you don't feel safe to vote, that I think is much more salient. Mm. And a lot of people increasingly don't feel safe even voting in person or acting as a poll worker or having a trans kid, which is also part of our threats to democracy, whether people's basic civil rights are protected. Do you feel safe existing in public in society? Um, whether you're black or a woman walking down the street or whether you're trans or what, whether, you know, whatever that may be, whether you're homeless. And, um, and it, I, so I think when it comes to communicating that, that visceral case um, outside of, of the hearings of January 6th, how that's put into context in the threat that that is today, I think we could do a better job of that. But, um, but, a lot of elections, a lot of times, are driven by very short-term issues, thinking, and priorities. And when you see this jockeying over narratives, it's about what we make urgent and how we respond to the urgent issues in our society right now. I think a great example of this in New York is public safety. I think that if you actually look at, if you do look at some of the public opinion polling, while public safety is a high concern in a lot of areas, People's conception of what makes us safe has also changed dramatically, and it has changed dramatically in the direction of activists and advocates that really, you know, whose, whose decades of work just splashed out uh, to the rest of the American electorate in 2020. But we're seeing huge shifts in public opinion on the fact that housing, access to mental health care, et cetera, keeps us safe. And not only that, it's not only an opinion. We're starting to see the real public data come out saying that too. In the Bronx, we, um, one of the arguments that I've made is because I, there is an election denier in, in New York. I mean, they, they exist in New York City. Lee Zeldin is running yeah. for governor. These are people who foundationally, you know, don't believe in, um, the peaceful transition of power, you know? I mean, that's really what this is about. And so he's running on public safety, but what one of the things that we've done is that we secured a community project fund 
And we started a pilot project in Jacoby Hospital to treat people who are committing violence and who have been victims of violence. And we've reduced reoccurrence of crime by more than 50%. It's been more effective than any policing intervention. And so using that storytelling is really important because it's not just about what issues are salient, but it's about what we're saying about those issues. You um, built a very successful multiracial coalition, a working class coalition in the Bronx in your district a, a couple times now. Obviously, the party has been having trouble with uh, non-college voters for some time. Originally, it was white voters. Now it's starting to be Latino voters mm -hmm. and even some black voters as well. Um, is this simply a matter of making a sharper economic argument? Are there cultural issues at play? Like, How can Democrats sort of win back uh, working class voters without a college degree? Uh, I think there's a couple things. One... Uh, I don't think we are aggressive on corporate power enough. I think that this, I think our party is shy. We're too scared. We're part of the same, you know, it, it, our entire political system is designed to be very, very acquiescent to money. And um, the difference is that Republicans, that's not a, that is part of Republican ideology, is to support corporate America. I think the Democratic Party, we really struggle because we're supposed to be the party of the working class. But in reality, there's a lot in our big tent, it's highly segmented. And I think that there is a lot of objections from that within our party, which prevents us from being as forceful on these issues as we can be. You know, it, you, and we can see this play out over and over across a lot of different issues. Um, you look at insulin, right? We're able to cap it at 35 if you're insured. What are we doing about the price of insulin for people who mm. don't have insurance? And that's where it, it really requires that at one juncture or another, there, is go there has to be a reining in of what's happening here. And I think that the, the sensing of that conflict is part of the complications that we're seeing in, um, in some of this working class support. I also think there's a conversation to be had about men and male identity. Because when we look into this, this, <laughs> this, I mean, it's not like, oh, we're, we're shedding Latino voters or we're shedding, we're shedding men. Yeah, young men too. Men. And it's not, it is important that we don't paint this with a broad brush because when we look into this, that is what's going to help us inform a strategy. And, um, and you know, I, I can at least say with Latino voters, we've never tried as a party. The Democratic Party has not tried in, in terms of Latino electorates. And I mean, where's our DREAM Act? Where is our immigration reform? And even recently with um, President Biden's uh, marijuana executive order, I very much applaud that he went there, but um, he exempted people who were convicted when the, if they were convicted while they were undocumented. And that is 90%. Mm. We're looking at the, the overwhelming majority of people who have been convicted that would benefit from that pardon have status, like they have status complications. And so we really need to step up both in our efforts on campaign, but also our efforts in governance. And I, I see these conversations and it's, it's tough because on the other side, they don't, they have no qualms. They don't, they have no qualms about having an anti-immigrant message. Right. Um, but I think we get scared of that and that segmentation prevents a clear message. And it, that, that lack of clarity makes it hard to win people over. I mean, I, I think another like brand challenge we have as a party is like, I listen to you talk and you're like a few years ago when I was tending bar and trying to make the rent, and like you've, you've lived the experience mm -hmm. that a lot of voters have. Mm -hmm. And then you look at the democratic leadership and they may have lived that experience 50 years ago, but like they don't seem, they don't look like a lot of the voters that we're trying to reach today, right? Mm -hmm. At this youth rally. How do you convince people you talk to on the trail that, 
Democratic Party gets their challenges will fight for them when they don't necessarily see themselves reflected in the people on TV all the time. Yeah, I mean, I'm honest with people. <laughs> I'm not here to sell people on this idea that like our our the, the leadership of the Democratic Party, which is overwhelmingly from one generation, almost uniformly from one generation and, and overwhelmingly from a lopsided class perspective is the same as me or you or anything else like that. Um, the Republican Party. Equal like worse, sure. but still, I think what's real this is why i've put a lot of effort into down ballot candidates across the country mm -hmm. i started an organization called courage to change and i was and a lot of it was motivated by our housing crisis because it's one of the biggest issues that we have right now but also we can't just solve it federally we need city councils we need municipalities yeah. and so by having exciting real deal candidates especially on a local level and we've done this and has been very successful in new york city tiffany caban zohran mamdani jabari brisport julia salazar people are like holy shit there's like cool people in my area that yeah. like are actually saying things that i never thought i'd hear a democrat say yeah, jamal bowman yeah there's like all jamal these young, bowman. exciting people yeah and so you know i think party leadership is a is a distinct conversation but it, i think what actually matters more is is are you excited to vote for anybody on your ballot who's going to turn it out on your ballot and the more local you get i actually think the more flexible and exciting your candidates can be because yeah. the broader your base is those people need to appeal to like everybody and it kind of can water things down a little yeah all right let's talk about some important things have you listened to midnights yet I have not listened to Midnight's yet. I what? need to. It's, I know. What am I just doing? Just to be right? clear, we're recording this. It's Sunday. It's been out for <laughs> 72 hours. It took me like two weeks to listen to Renaissance, too. I'm you've like flown so... on a plane since you've had a whole plane ride. <laughs> were we reading a briefing book? To do, yeah. find, I have to some listen issues? to the whole thing through, too. I'm not, I'm not going to do the one song, wait for a song on a radio, either. Yeah, I'd hope not. I hope not. <laughs> Um, Eric Adams recently did a press conference where he declared war on the rats. Uh, <laughs> uh, do you support that war? And more importantly, do you support hilarious press conferences where they talk about the rats as the enemy? And is it something that could unite New York City and maybe yeah. the country? Listen, I will say, <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm, no. <laughs> I'm a huge Department of Sanitation stan. Mm -hmm. And so the sanitation. I'm uh, Department of Sanitation. <laughs> I am the secretary. Uh -huh. And so I am 100% biggest fan of uh, New York City DO, uh, DOS, D Department of Sanitation. Um, so yeah, I think it's great. I think it's wonderful. Do you have a Halloween costume picked out? Um, I was shopping for them on the okay. flight over because what are you thinking about? I was thinking like, you know, uh, if I could do like Toon Squad with my dog, okay. that would be fun. But I'm I'm still taking suggestions. And while you're out here, will you be going to in and out and is there anything you can do at a federal level to take on the quality of the fries? <laughs> Thank you for saying this. People need to talk about it. Thank you for saying mm -hmm. this because every time I come out here, everyone's like, oh my God, in and out, in and out. And I'm like, my controversial non-political opinion is that it's overrated. Yes. 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 But it's Thank because you. like I'm a big fry person. What are they doing? What with this is thing? this dry fry thing going Dr on here? Drive a, there's other fries nearby they can sample and learn i agree and then the people say get order them well done i gotta do a special order make them right yeah thank you i mean you said it all so that's it. uh that's all i had to <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you aoc for of being course. here thank so no thank you yeah. thank you all I really appreciate it Thanks to AOC for joining us today. Thanks to everyone uh, in Irvine who uh, who talked to us, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Yeah, if you live in uh, Orange County, you better help Katie Porter turn on. Get you help Katie Porter. Please she, get to the polls. She, she that whiteboard is for you. We need her. <laughs> I don't know what that means.
Pod Save America is a Crooked Media production. The executive producer is Michael Martinez. Our senior producer is Andy Gardner Bernstein. Our producers are Haley Muse and Olivia Martinez. It's mixed and edited by Andrew Chadwick. Kyle Seglin and Charlotte Landis sound engineered the show. Thanks to Hallie Kiefer, Ari Schwartz, Sandy Gerard, Andy Taft, and Justine Howe for production support. And to our digital team, Elijah Cohn, Phoebe Bradford, Milo Kim, and Amelia Montu. Our episodes are uploaded as videos at youtube.com slash podsaveamerica. 